I'll take a breath. Got it. Got it. Well, those of you that have just joined, we kind of jumped into some conversation already, but we're excited to um, uh, introduce Felicia. And is it Renhel or Rangel? Renhel Saponara. Saponara. She's with Sidewalk Schools. And I just accidentally stumbled across her Googling around, looking at uh, looking for information about racism um, on the border and found a uh, sidewalk school, which Felicia is a founder of and uh, Loretto's Love Education. And so she's gonna talk a little bit about that and, and her work and her work in Reynoso. And it's probably better for use the time for her to speak with us. So welcome. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, so yes, I am one of the founders of the Sidewalk School. Uh, we started in, well, the organization started in 2019, uh, but Victor Cavazos and I, the other director of the Sidewalk School, met in 2018 in Matamoros. That's where our NGO started. And we served the entire two years inside the Matamoros encampment. Uh, if you are on social media, Facebook or Instagram, you can see the very first day up until today, all the years. Cool. Yes. <laughs> uh, we like and to it's show people. Sidewalk school, Felicia? Yeah, it's the Sidewalk School for Children Asylum Seekers, is the full name, but the Sidewalk School should pull us up. Okay. Um, but we post all the time. We like for people to see where their money is going. So you see us all the way back then. Um, so we did the entire two years in the, inside the Matamoros encampment. We were there the last day of the Matamoros encampment um, as most of our staff uh, was able to cross and said goodbye to everyone. And as one camp closed, literally a week before the ending of the Matamoros encampment, the Reynosa encampment started, which was 45 minutes down the highway. So for about a week, maybe two, we were going back and forth between two cities, closing one down as the other opened up. Uh, that's how we moved to Reynosa. In Reynosa, for the first two months, no other American would cross into that city for a very good reason. You really shouldn't. Uh, but Victor Cavazos and I did. So the sidewalk school turned into a rapid response organization uh, as we speak, the sidewalk school has built and owns a shelter in Reynosa. It's called the Kaleo Shelter. It's meant for children and their families. We are at full capacity, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, and we also have people living outside of our shelter, but I'll get to that in a second as well. Uh, and we also do medical care. The sidewalk school has its own clinic. Our doctors, 10, are pediatricians who are based in San Francisco. Uh, they do telehealth once a week inside of our shelter. Uh, it used to be inside of our school, but I'll get back to that as well. <laughs> and we also uh, feed people thousands every single day. And then last but not least, we are a school. Uh, education, it's actually number four uh, because obviously you have to feel safe. So you need shelter. You need to eat. That's two. And then you need to feel a healthy three. And then you can probably learn something, which is four. The sidewalk school does one through four every single day. Back to Reynosa. Reynosa. Hmm. Reynosa was the last encampment along the US border. It closed this month on May 2nd, 2022, in the middle of the night. Wow. Uh, Victor and I got a call uh, because the sidewalk school was providing food inside the camp every single week. Uh, we don't make that public. We don't make a lot of stuff public in Reynosa for security reasons, uh, but we do support a lot of things inside that city. And the encampment was one of them. Uh, but anyway, we got calls that night. People were being moved. Victor and I rushed over to Reynosa and they shut the camp down. Uh, Mexican military was everywhere. Uh, state officials, city officials, everyone was out there as the camp was emptied out and bulldozers were brought in and they knocked stuff over and tore it down. Uh, they had about eight or 10 dump trucks out there 
as they were throwing everything away. As for the people, uh, as we speak, Reynosa has a huge homeless population from that night. So people are not only sleeping outside of the sidewalk school shelter, the Kaleo shelter, they're sleeping outside of all the shelters. It's a huge homeless population that now lives out there. Most of the asylum seekers are Haitian. We have a lot of black asylum seekers now um, who are trying to cross into the US legally. So this has caused a food shortage in the city of Reynosa because it's so many people. All the shelters are at full capacity. Uh, personally, for my shelter, we put tents out in the middle of it to take in more families. All the shelters have done the same. We've taken in more than we could handle what we intended. And yet we have hundreds and hundreds of people living on the streets, living in front of our shelters, living in a ballpark. You see little pop-up camps as you go from shelter to shelter. Um, and it's babies living outside with their families, children living outside with their parents. Any kind of situation you can think of is now living outside in Reynosa out in the open in one of the most dangerous cities actually in the world. That's why the Americans didn't want to cross to begin with. So you, now you have people just living outside. Um, and of course, assaults and robberies and everything else happens because you're sleeping outside. But um, that brings us kind of more up to speed to today. Um, there are exemption processes in all the border cities, not just Reynosa. But Reynosa seems to have more kind of a leeway. The sidewalk school is doing one of the exemption processes as well in Reynosa. Uh, we work seven days a week to help cross people legally. Uh, the staff works 10 hour days. Victor and I work right along with them. So I get it why people are coming to Reynosa. You should come, you have a chance of crossing there but it's just called, caused a hardship on everyone. And it's hard to, to see people, especially children living outside of a shelter as you go inside of it. We take in what we can like everybody else. Um, besides that, Reynosa is forever changing. So I'm willing to open this up for questions because I know some volunteers who were here like a month ago, they come back and they're like, what happened? <laughs> then I have to like backtrack for them. This is where we are today. Because inside the Reynosa encampment, you had about 2,500 people at one point living inside that very small camp, like jammed one on top of the other. And the COVID outbreaks, we've had three so far, as well as chicken pox outbreaks, we've had two. So, all of these things, that was like last month. That's how much things change in Reynosa. So I can't open this up for questions because Reynosa is like everywhere. <laughs> if anyone has any questions about Reynosa in particular, our Matamoros, the sidewalk school has stepped back into Matamoros um, on Monday. We're back in that city as well, helping out the asylum seekers. We just got an office. Mm. Okay, Felicia, I've got a question. Um, so what day did you say they came in and destroyed the camp? Was May 2nd. May 2nd. And did that <clears throat> did that make the news? Because when 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 Chaparral, when Chaparral was, you know, bulldozed at four in the morning, you know, we at least found found the articles about that. Right. So no. nobody covered it. I mean, it was covered by the local reporters right. here, okay. but nothing. No, nothing. And and who came in? Was it um, mil Mexican military or border patrol people or? Oh, border patrol never step over there. Over it's the um, it's Mex into Reynosa. Uh huh. So it's Mexican military. Mexican military, as opposed to like the police, right? They were all there. That's the other, oh. everyone was present. We were there to see who was present. We even took pictures of it, but everybody was present that night. And um, has that been posted on uh, your social media? Yes. 
Okay. Uh, I, not the pictures of the military. Uh, that's for our own safety reasons. But okay, the, right. the night the camp went down, if you go back on social media, you okay. see pictures I took with my own phone. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah I'll do that. I have a I'll question, but I'd like to let Vivian go first. Vivian. Thank you. I have two quick questions. <clears throat> Excuse me. Felicia, my first, I came in a little late. Felicia, I'm Vivian. That's my me. first question is, exactly where is Reynosa located? And secondly, how can we help you? Reynosa is, is right across from McAllen. Ah. It's on the Doggo Bridge. And it's 45 minutes away from Matamoros. Mm -hmm. I live in Brownsville, so I'm across the street from Matamoros. Mm -hmm. um, and the best way to help is to donate. So I can provide something uh, to Roxanne because it doesn't have to be directly to the sidewalk school. Please donate to any of the shelters in Reynosa. All of us are stretched beyond belief. Uh, so I can provide the list afterwards of the shelters. Thank you. Please do that. Thank you. Thank you. Felicia, my question is um, about the destruction of this encampment. And I guess my question to you is, um, in your opinion, even though the camp conditions were horrendous, migrants yeah. were better off there than just being dispersed and now homeless on the streets? Is, is that right? Inside the camp, we provided food every day. There were porta potties that were paid for. There were huge tanks of waters on each corner of the encampment. Uh, medical teams came five days a week. They rotated. The sidewalk school has and still does, but our buildings, the three story building, was literally like 10 steps away from that camp. Wow. So that camp, we made it as nice as we could, but you had everything you needed right there. We brought it to you. Yeah. <laughs> Whereas now you're just spread out from street to street and you're moving around from place to place because you have to, you have especially people with children. Yeah. Uh, if, if the people who run that city no. can easily get a hold of you, they'll easily get a hold of you, your children, your husband, your mom, your dad, they'll take the whole family. So you are constantly having to look over your shoulder and watch out. And people do take turns sleeping on the street, which you should take, you shouldn't be asleep on the street, but if you are, someone should be watching you. Not trying to say that would help much because yeah. people still get robbed by gunpoint and assaulted and all the other stuff. But at least you'll have a warning to wake up before it happens to you. And so, so then the my other question is, what do the Mexican authorities say? Why did why did they want to come in and destroy this camp? What's the, what's their rationale? <sighs> oh my, that goes back. In, so the. When all of this started, uh, the mayor, her name is Mackie, uh, she did not want to deal with the problem. And she made that very clear. As it grew, her term was coming to an end. Her son took her place. His name is Carlos. Carlos made a promise that he would get, the encampment used to be in a plaza, like right in the middle of the city. Once you crossed, you couldn't miss it. And the residents thought it was the ugliest thing ever to have asylum seekers living there. Once he came into office, he promised he would get the square back for the people of Reynosa. That's why it was closed down. Carlos Pena is now on the run. He's now the ex-mayor of Reynosa. He <laughs> has worn out for his arrest uh, for some things he did in his short term. Uh, but he closed a, a camp and he's now on the run. Thank you. My Bob. Bob. Yes. Uh, thanks so much, Felicia, for for the for the work that you folks. Hey, Bob. Did. Bob, introduce yourself. Yeah, I'm I'm Bob Key. I, uh, as Mary Jean said, I just came back from Agua Prieta uh, Wednesday afternoon, and I'm in Ogales a couple times a week. Uh, my question is, um, how many people? Do the shelters, do your shelters accommodate and, and how does that work? What's the length of stay? And uh, if you can give me just some, some information about that. So there are 
Reynosa is small. Let me just say that when we came there, there was only two shelters. Um, since we've been there, there's Senda de Vida, which is the largest shelter that holds a thousand people. And wow. then all of the American NGOs and the Mexican NGOs and government actually came together and we all built Senda de Vida too. That was an effort on everybody's part. Um, Senda de Vida too was actually kind of taken over by Carlos before he left the off left office abruptly. Um, actually, that happened this week when he decided to leave. But um, that Senda de Vida too is meant to hold a thousand people as well. Uh, then smaller shelters came up. Uh, Pastor Isaac runs one. Uh, his shelter holds 200 people. And the Kaleo shelter, which is a sidewalk school shelter, we hold 200 people, even though we now have tents in the middle of our shelter. Um, so, and then there's Casa Migrante Reynosa. They hold 350 people. So you have all of these shelters and you have maybe 2000 homeless people right now as we speak. The crowds are large, it's, it's very hard, but we also feed people who are homeless. Uh, we, like I said, we support a lot of things. We do feed the homeless population as well. Uh, we fund it through two of our partners, uh, Pastor Mary Lou and Pastor Mara. Wow. Thank you. Um, wow. <laughs> I, I forgot my question, <laughs> I guess. Um, well, I know that the camp in Tijuana was bulldozed down, but it, the Mexican government was working with our government, you know, to do it. Yeah. And I'm of sure course. that's what happened. The Mexican government did it at the bequest, you know, to get yes. uh, it done. Um, and Wow. Um, so how many people cross a day get asylum from there? Do you have any idea? Of course, we help with the exemptions. I yeah. know the number. Um, that's something that, that all the NGOs, we decided not to make public because we don't want more people to come. Oh, uh, okay. But I, I can say in Reynosa, we have the largest number of legal crossings than any other border city. We literally do work constantly, uh, hand in hand with our partners on the Mexico side. Um, oh, we have the largest legal crossings, yes. That's why I don't discourage as asylum seekers from coming to Reynosa. I like word has gotten out and good for you if you can make it there safely and you can be there safe as we process all of the stuff we have to process and before you get the phone call, I'm for that. Mm -hmm. What I'm not for is the US government not assisting in this effort. These are future US citizens we're talking about that you're leaving homeless, vulnerable and hungry out in the street. As you tell American NGOs like the sidewalk school, good luck to you, find your own funding. We will give you nothing. Which has been told to me to my face for the last year from uh, Biden's administration. Oh, whoever wants to go, sorry. I'm just gonna, I wanna Jump say there, two things. First, I know that your fame has spread sufficiently so that the coyotes here in Guatemala are taking the people that I know who are going your way. Because yeah. one, one of the coyotes of my friend is, well, now in detention because that, anyway, that part, indeed, you are known well. <laughs> for being the best place yeah. um, as far south as I am and probably further. Anyway, the other thing I was interested in is that there are so many Haitians there as there are in Tijuana. And what we hear from the connections of this group to, to especially Espacio Migrante, that the school situation for Haitians is pretty miserable because of the Mexican prejudice not to let them in. Is that happening with you too? 
There is, yes, there is a lot of discrimination um, towards the, the Black asylum seekers, the Haitians and Africans, but mostly Haitians are in Reynosa. Um, it's, so I'm Black, but I'm also part Mexican, but I identify as Black, because uh, that's how I was raised. And it's, <laughs> When speaking to Haitians, and they often tell me about the discrimination uh, that they face, the abuse, especially the women uh, by others, because they do stand out. Uh, I have to tell everyone I'm black, like you don't have to tell me about it. I know I get it here on the US side. It doesn't get better on this side. It's just different. That's it. Um, but let me put it this way. Before we had the Haitian population come to Reynosa about a month or so now, it was mainly Central Americans. So as Central Americans get desperate, they lived inside the camp, which was awful. Don't get me wrong. People were willing to work with that and say, okay, you know, they're desperate. This is happening. As the Haitians come in and their desperation shows, a lot of the NGOs, Americans are like, oh no, I'm scared. And that offends me. What are you scared no. for? You weren't scared about the Central Americans when their desperation was showing and they got kind of riled up. Y'all stayed and you calmed them down, but black people come and now you're scared and you wanna leave, which actually happened recently. They came back, but it's discrimination like that where I think sometimes you don't even realize that you're you know, you're okay with one group acting this way, but the other group, you have to go home. I'm scared now. But that's something I think everyone has to work on, to be honest, because, you know, that's not, it's just underlining there that you just have to kind of check yourself and say like, okay, I can help the asylum seekers out. I just need to speak with them and be calm and calm them down. We are working hard. We are trying to get you across. I want you in America more than anybody else. I, I want people to have their American dream. Thank you so much. So, Carolyn? Oh, whoever wants to go. Carolyn, you're muted. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Felicia, for all the work you're doing. And I'm so sorry that about all the discrimination, so sorry. And I was just wondering, have any uh, of the people that have made it across, any of the asylum seekers, uh, have they, uh, are they Haitian? Have the Haitian uh, asylum seekers been able to successfully get processed? Oh, of course. The majority are Haitian asylum seekers. Okay. <laughs> That's the biggest group we're getting across. Uh, the Central Americans actually feel <laughs> discriminated against at this moment because they're like, you're only crossing the Black people. And it's like, we don't make the decision. That's up to the U.S. government. The only thing we do is process the application. Okay. Who gets into our country is not up to the sidewalk school. No. <clears throat> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. And then if I can add about the Ukrainians, uh, because that's another, that goes into the discrimination because we do have Ukrainians in the in Reynosa. And let me say before the camp was closed down on May 2nd, the Ukrainians will walk right past the camp up to the port of entry and walk straight into our country. And that was a hard thing for the asylum seekers to swallow because they could not understand why one group got in and the other group could not. And if you're talking about Hondurans, then everyone here knows their country was destroyed. And if you're talking about Haitians, everyone definitely knows their country was destroyed. And when this was brought up to Biden's administration, um, and because don't tell me about wars, because in Ethiopia, there are wars as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not because we're, they're in a war. There are other people in that camp whose country is also in a very deadly war. Um, I was told that it was because the Ukrainians will go home in two years. That's why they get to walk into our country, unlike <laughs> the other asylum seekers. So all that kind of goes together about 
<laughs> while we have brown and black people stuck in Mexico, mm. but yet Ukrainians can walk into our country. Now we all know Ukrainians aren't leaving in two years, <laughs> but I guess they just had to say something. So that's what they said. And so they'll have the proper paperwork just to stay. They the do. They also get a work permit. Uh, whereas the other asylum seekers have to pay, wait six months to a year. If you're not a, you, if you're not a white asylum seeker, it's very different. And Ukrainians are actually getting a two year leeway whereas the other asylum seekers, you get about a year. So I was very surprised of uh, the stuff they were giving. They, they are giving the Ukrainians. They're giving them really everything. And they figured it out with, within a week span. Let me add that, because this yeah. what's going on at the border, this has been years. The sidewalk school started in 2019. Ukrainians, they figured that out within seven days and they set this program up for them. We had heard, and Tijuana at uh, the Open Chaparral, and I think she, uh, Paulina told us 14,000 Ukrainians were processed in like a week and a half when before they said they, 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 couldn't, they couldn't do that. Uh, speak about, you mentioned the uh, exemption process. Um, I don't know what that is. Um, and is that everybody that's coming through? Is that when they're uh, you know, applying for asylum? I just don't know the, the details of that. Um, so the exemption process I'm talking about is actually happening at other ports of entry, uh, just not in such a large number. And you can look it up. It's called WISHA, and it's H-U-I-S-H-A. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's called the WISHA process. Okay. And from my belief is... Reynosa got such a big leeway in this is because we were the last standing camp and the U.S. just wanted to clear it out. So that's how we got this big number that we get every single day. Mm -hmm. So they cleared out. Most of the people inside that camp actually crossed within two weeks. But then they got this huge flood of the Haitian population, which is now what takes up really Reynosa. And we were on the verge of looking like the pictures in Del Rio. Mm -hmm. And they couldn't let that happen. So they kept the process going. And it continues to this day. I don't know this now, I don't make wanna make this sound like this has been happening for a while. This has been happening for one month, just one month. Mm -hmm. Then that one month they cleared out of camp. They got a lot of Haitian families across and we may just have one more week with it. All of this isn't, this is all very short term solution to a long-term problem. Vivian, you had a question. Yes, I did. I have a comment, Felicia, and then a question I'd like to ask. And I want to say, oh, this is a very painful sitting here and you're doing a very beautiful job yeah. of helping us have an agonizing meditation on the original sin of America. Thank you. It's very, very painful and very humiliating. <clears throat> and that being said, how you mentioned that you are getting people process and move. where in the world are you doing this work? Where are the phone calls? Do the, first of all, do the Haitians coming in with, if they're ever lucky enough to get through with their papers, do they have to wear their ankle bracelets? How do you get the phone calls made? Where do they go from there? Who's doing all that work? And then I have another question after that. So that's my first question. Um, so once, uh, uh asylum seeking family makes it into the US, they usually go to the respite center ran by Catholic charities. And from there, they, I think they give them two days, maybe three days, and then you have to go to your sponsor family. Now to make it across from Mexico to the US, you have to have a sponsor family. If you don't have one, you're not crossing. Mm -hmm. So you have to go someplace <laughs> once you cross into the US fly out, bus, whatever, however your family decides to pay for that. Mm -hmm. Now from there, and I know this because of our original staff in Matamoros. Um, oh, let me say our staff are asylum seekers up until a month ago. So our staff in Matamoros, who we, we still stay in touch with, um, is no longer ankle bracelets here. Um, they uh, put something inside your cell phone oh. and they, they track you. And you have to meet with your 
ICE, our officer, I think once every other week or once a month, and you have to be inside your home for 24 hours, like mm -hmm. once a month. And if you're not, you're in trouble. Mm -hmm. So they have a whole lot of restrictions. And my question was, how are you going to keep a job if you have to like <laughs> stay home one day? And, and it's always in the middle of the week. That makes no sense. Um, but you're not supposed to be working as an asylum seeker. So that's the thing. If you're caught working, then you're in trouble. Uh, if you're not home for that day for 24 hours, then you're in trouble. If your cell phone isn't on so they can track you, you're in trouble. So all of that can get you deported. I mean, it's, it's all just set up to fail. So, but it's very mm. tricky and expensive. The other question I have, it's very clumsy because I, I don't know how to ask this question. But when you say you've been told by the Biden administration and then they say this, they, are there actual spokespersons who say these things to you? You know, like when they set up the process for the Ukrainian refugees and they say, well, we're doing this. And who, who when you say the Biden administration, is there a real person who speaks to you all or you just get emails or letters or what? I don't know. Uh, so let me say I've met Mayorkas a couple of times now. We have face-to-face -face meetings with Biden's administration. They do they out. listen? Do they look human? Are they responding? <laughs> it's, let me say our third meeting with Mayorkas and his staff was very sad. Uh, one of his staff members actually broke down crying. This job is a lot and seeing it is a lot. And I get the heartbreak of it. And I also understand they, they have a job. I get that. Do they listen? My answer would be no. And we have met them face-to-face -face a couple of times. Uh, we also have Zoom meetings with them. These aren't spokespeople. This, these are people from Biden's actual administration that meets with us, all of us. It's a group of us uh, on a committee. And as American NGOs, we do meet with his administration and we talk about what's best for the asylum seekers and they listen to what we see. When I've been told no, I was told no by <laughs> I want to stop people multiple times because <laughs> I've tried in different ways in different meetings and the answer was always no, um, because we work on the Mexico side. The U.S. government doesn't pay for anything in Mexico, so we can't help any American NGO on that side. And they don't. They have not to this day. Um, but they expect us to do their job, which we do to this day. Um, and then as far as the Ukrainian question, that was in a room in D.C. one day. Uh, in, in, our, in our building as Americans. That was in a building in DC. The Ukrainian situation was extremely unfair. And I was the only one that was hurt by it. Gerlene Joseph with the Haitian Bridge Alliance, the director of that NGO was extremely hurt by it. She's Haitian. Mm -hmm. And it was just like, why is it this way, not that way? Uh, let me also say, Gerlene and I are the only two black directors that run an NGO on the border. <laughs> There's only two of us, everybody else. Yeah. is white um but that's a different conversation so when stuff like that happened russians come when afghanistan when that whole situation happened we actually had a teacher in reynosa who was from afghanistan he was treated differently from the rest of our staff mm -hmm. by the u.s government and he actually he crossed last year while our his staff members are still sitting in reynosa it's just a lot of unfairness to it um, so I have conversations with uh, Biden's administration here in our region, because we're divided by regions, all of us. And then Gerlene has our own conversations in Tijuana with them. And then we get together and we talk about what did they say to you? What did they say to me? So do you, do you think there's any real way to effect change, How, what's what's the pathway to change? Uh, are the they Ukraine real or the no is no negotiation. So I don't. I think the Ukrainians, like they, they have it differently because so many people were outraged by it yes. and they just felt mm -hmm. so personally affected by it. But when stuff happens like in Haiti, that's like a soundbite in our news to the rest of us Americans. Unlike the Ukrainian, which is like the cover story, yes. which has been the cover story for a while now. Yeah. 
So, I, I mean, it's a lot on how the media puts it, what we care about as Americans. If more people were outraged, the Reynosa encampment would have been up, up until this point. It was only taken down because the Mexican military came in because Carlos was, Carlos was in office at that time. Right. And he wanted to keep a promise. But people aren't outraged by what's happening in Reynosa. Like y'all didn't even know the camp was taken down. It's like no one really cares about that mm -hmm. because it's brown and black people sitting out there. The Reynosa encampment was a year and two months before it was taken down. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. Okay. Bob, you, Bob, you have a question. We're with you, girl. We're with you. Yeah. 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 My other question is, uh, Felicia, do you have people that have been there uh, long term? I know in Nogales, we've had families that have been there for a year or longer waiting. Do you have that same situation there? Yes. Well, so it may have changed at this point. Um, when the Reynosa encampment came down and once the exemption process started, we have, and let me say, because I'm very proud of this fact, <laughs> on the US side and Mexico side, we're like hand in hand. We're all in the same group. We are all together. We work together as a team. So once that camp came down, I asked my partners, go out there and find the people who've been in that camp this entire time and let's cross them. And they were the first applications we submitted. If you've been there for a year, a year and a month, I put you in first so you can get out of there. If those people are still there, I would have to actually go back and check this process. Like Al Ultralato, um, I'm friends with, besides Erica, I'm friends also with some of their volunteers. And I was like, well, how many cases do y'all do a day? And she does five because they collect all this data information. We collected two because that's what helps change laws. If you could say, this is what's happening. Um, but it's a very slow process. Uh, to date, the sidewalk school, we've done over 2,000, and I'm very proud of that because not a lot of NGOs can hit that type of number. But we've also had to hire a lot of staff to work nine and 10 hour days just to hit that number. It's a lot. And so it's backlogged down here as well. But it also keeps CBP on, on their toes, right? Because the number is like, let me tell you, in a normal border town, you get 25 people a day to cross. <laughs> 25, right. a normal border, border town. Our number is elevated by that much. But still that much is getting people to come and your chances are higher because our numbers are elevated by this much. So we submit 70 to 100 cases a day to keep CBP on their toes. And like, look, this, like the past two weeks, we've done nothing but homeless families and homeless children. Just to show CBP, this is who you're leaving out there. In Reynosa, Mexico, this is who you're making sleep out in the street. Homeless, 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 homeless. So we focus on different things. And yeah, we want you to feel bad. <laughs> I know you have a job too, but I also want you to see who you're making sleep out in the street every night as you sleep safely on the U.S. side. Yeah. Felicia, so, are, are you doing... Your numbers are much better, as you've told us, than other locations along the border. Are you doing something different or are you just doing more of it? Do you have do you have secrets that you can share with others along the border? Why are you so successful number wise? I hire more staff. Is that it? Okay. That's it. I hire more staff. And also let me say I don't speak Spanish. That's the the one like weird thing about me. I have never learned Spanish. So when I do cases myself personally, because I, I do them up until 10 midnight sometimes. I don't, when you talk to people, they wouldn't tell you the story, this is what happened, blah, 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 but I can't speak Spanish. So I just need for you to answer this question. <laughs> yes or no? Yes, no. Tell me in a sentence or two what happened. Okay. Can I see your IDs? Great. Who's your sponsor? Okay. Thank you. You have a good night. I'll talk to you later. I go through cases like that because I don't speak. Spanish. Why does so that not understand. happen everywhere along the border? I'm not, I don't quite understand. <clears throat> well, because like my staff, everyone speaks Spanish, but me, even Victor speaks Spanish. I'm the only one. Um, but so there's something in being heard. And I like that too. My staff, they'll call you and people want you to 
hear what happened. And I want you to listen to what happened because probably no one else is going to listen to that. Yeah. So the phone calls, they do take a long time. And I tell my staff, that's fine. Just get the information and then move on after you're done with it. I'm just different in a way that I don't speak it. So I can really only hit the highlights. And then I tell the person, thank you for your time, but I have to move on. And then I go to the next one. Yeah. Um, so, but that's the reason why we are traveling the border actually within the next, these two weeks, starting next week. We are trying to do a bigger, so we are partnered with Haitian Bridge Alliance. We're a partner with El Ochilado. We're partnered with Las Americas. And we just stepped back into Matamoros. We want to do a huge effort up and down from one end to the other end of the border mm-hmm. of doing these cases. Uh, the sidewalk school, we've saturated Reynosa. I'm not trying to say there aren't thousands more people, but we've got like a nice little number to where it can spread out. Mm-hmm. If we all agree, like, this is what we're going to do together. And so far, and just the little baby of the conversations I've had with the directors along the border, everyone's like, that's a great idea. Let's do that. And I'm like, yeah, let's do that. So that's why we're traveling up and down the border, because we just want to sit face to face, make sure we're all doing the same thing, and then put the word out. Like you can hit any of these NGOs and we can help process your application from Tijuana to Matamoros. Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, I'd like to know if there's any way that Loretto can support that effort that you just described to spread this up and down the border. We're going, y'all are the first place we're hitting. We'll be there on Tuesday. All right. Yes, and it, please uh, get my number because Victor and I, we're actually calling people today and tomorrow. We like to set up meetings. Because Laredo, you guys are the most underserved. Eagle Pass. Uh, Time out. Yeah. Loretto, the, the Loretto community is not located in Laredo, Texas. No. Ooh, tell me, Mary Jean. Is we do have a presence. <laughs> we do have a presence in El Paso. And we do have a relationship with Las Americas there. And That's we're so in Tijuana. And we're in Tijuana. And we have partners like Bob in Nogales. Arizona. Uh, yeah. We're hitting El Paso, Juarez, uh, Piedras, Negras. Uh, we're doing that area on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday uh, because there is not an NGO there uh, large enough to take on the processing of that area. Mm-hmm. Uh, which is, it, is, is that in uh, El Paso? No. All that's in the same kind of Rip. little thing right there. It's like five hours away from us. So we're just going to like area to area. Tijuana, that's different because you guys have El Ochilado and Haitian Bridge Alliance. And both right. those engineers are big enough. And we have about 2,000 Haitians right now. Oh, that's not a lot. That's not a lot. It's just, uh. <laughs> there might be more, but you know yeah I, erica and, and girlie they do a great job in tijuana absolutely uh-huh. wonderful and so uh, i know about girlie who's erica which group is she connected with oh uh erica pinharo and nicole miller they're with el ultralato okay and you're going to give us that list right of these folks yes and they do both sides and so does girlie they're really they do mexico and the u.s side okay uh, both um, great ngos um, and so when you talk about hiring more staff, so is your staff um, U.S. citizens or are they all asylum seekers or both? No. Uh, our staff used to be nothing but asylum seekers who had degrees from their home countries as our uh-huh. teachers, uh, but they all crossed a month ago. So okay. right now, the entire staff are um, Reynosa residents, Mexican nationals. And you mentioned that when they when the, the families cross that they go to, was it res- Respite Center? Respite Center? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. And they can stay there a couple days and then they Two go on to their sponsored family. So yes. who are these families? And, and is there some way we can be involved in that aspect of it once they are across? Do they all have somebody to go to? And that's not a need. Oh, no, it's a huge need. Because so what happens is, and I think people don't really understand that the sidewalk school Like you can speak to a staff member, but like, so everything comes through me first and then I disperse it out to the staff. 
So if you're using the same sponsor, the same name, the same address, I'm the one that's seeing it with different people <laughs> over and over again. And I'm like, hmm, someone's not telling the truth about who's really sponsoring you. Um, the asylum seekers know they have to have a sponsor. They know that. So yes, of course, they share information because once you cross, no one is tracking you the first week or two. You could literally cross, go to Hawaii. We would not know. No one right. in the country would know. Only thing we need to know is where can we send you some legal papers uh, within next month to tell you when your court date is and you better show up in that city and state you said that you were going to be in as you are in Hawaii, just fly down there. So, so can people step forward and offer to be a sponsoring family or is that considered you sure not can. Legit? No, you can, be, you can sponsor whoever you like. <laughs> you can sponsor whoever you like and the U.S. government would say, okay. Okay, I had no idea. Yeah, so yes. I, I'm really, I'm really curious, but because you blanketly call things asylum seekers, and I know from the people who I know who are leaving here, that the the requirements for asylum don't always fit those who are right. primarily going because of their of crashing poverty, and and so I'm really curious because I know like uh, the current one that I send money to in his detention place um, it has a place where he knows he can go to work and so those are the people that are quotes his sponsors yeah. but I'm curious about if there's a different people some people come to the border and know that they have another place to go other people go to the border and they have no clue where they're going to be able to go so how do you how does that affect how what you see? So I call everyone asylum seekers. Um, first, because usually when people say migrants, especially on the US side, there's some negative connotation to it. And I don't like that. Seeking asylum is a legal thing. That's why I use a blanket statement, asylum seekers. If you're coming to this country, then your hope probably is to stay here for many, many years. And I want you to stay for those many, many years. Now, whether or not you get asylum, the answer is probably no to be honest. Of the original Matamoras staff, of the 12 people, only one has won asylum out of everybody. Um, I'm sorry, but but I don't, I don't, as we do the process, I don't like put Good. people in this category, that category, because um, what I do is collect data though, because yes, you not be able to eat or you're sleeping outside on the streets in your home country. I've seen pictures of everything. I've seen a picture of a man on fire. I've seen a picture of people living outside in a mud hut. I've seen everything. And the US government does not count that as a reason to come to our country to seek asylum, even though you're probably starving to death in your country. That's why we, we collect the data that we are collecting now. And we are gonna share it with some groups in Washington who have promised to use it to change some of the laws. We're also gonna share it with some legal NGOs who go to Washington to change some laws about what you can say to claim asylum. Right now, this exemption process, to be honest with you, you have to be kidnapped or assaulted. That's ridiculous. And if you're not one of those two, I'm supposed to tell you whether you can't come to our country, which I don't. I then ask you, do you have a serious medical condition? And if you tell me you have asthma, I tell you that counts. Mm -hmm. Because you. all this other stuff, our country was, will tell you, no, you can't come to the country. You can't but be. The, you, can't, you can't come to the US, but the question should be, why are these questions not asked to the Ukrainians? No one's asking them if they've been kidnapped or assaulted while they've been in Mexico. No one's asking them if they're dying of something. Instead, we just let them walk in. So why is it? the minorities have to be hurt or dying to come into our country. That's why I don't like those exemption questions. And if you tell me no about something, I'll find another something because we're all hurting in one way or the other. So Felicia, what you were just saying are the questions you ask people. How does that relate to, um, you haven't mentioned the credible fear interview that we hear asylum seekers have to go through as step number one. Is that, tell us about that. Mm. Oh, this is so painful for you. I can see mm. that. 
because the credible fear interview, it's incredibly unfair if you don't say the right sentence. Mm -hmm. If you don't say the right sentence, then it's literally over. That's it. You're done. Yeah. And you have to say the right sentence like at the very beginning of that conversation. So it's incredibly unfair. And uh, you know, there are thousands of asylum seekers. We can't tell everyone this is what you need to say. And people don't realize that once you sit down with the officer and say, I've come here because I'm, I'm looking for work, I need a job. That's it, you're done. We're gonna deport you or expel you. That's the wrong answer. So the ones that you successfully help get through the process, you help prepare them for this interview? They don't have to do interviews. Why? They're exempt from, because it's an exemption. If you go through the sidewalk school, you don't do an interview. Because it's an exemption. Yeah. Oh, okay. Boy, this is like rocks. This is the first time <laughs> learning about there being exemptions. Yeah, you don't have to do that. The only thing I have to know is if you've been kidnapped, assaulted, or you have a serious medical uh, condition. That's it. I need to know one of those three. And if the answer and is yes to, to any one of them, you you can well then you have to tell me about it and then i submit it and then the u.s government then decides whether or not you okay. come into our country wow very first step that's I mean, why people are flocking to reynosa <laughs> this is why everyone's coming to us right now that's, the, that's your secret <laughs> <laughs> so as we're still trying to there's just so much information that you can see we don't know um so what title title 42 yeah how does that impact your existence right now and their existence? Um, if Title 42 had lifted, the sidewalk school would have left Reynosa. Um, but it didn't, and we knew it wasn't. We got the word two weeks before. So we have Title 42, I think, for another year now. Um, and but so you it, would have left because? There would have been no need for us. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. We would have moved on. We have a school in Africa that we never talk about because <laughs> we have so many other things going on. But we probably yeah, would have focused sorry, on I didn't hear that. Africa. I didn't hear that. You have a what? A school in Africa. Which that country? we never. Yeah. Uh, it's inside the Zaleka encampment. It's Malawi. Mm -hmm. um, but we like we never talk about it. But that's been going on for almost a year. <laughs> so we probably would have left and like focused on that. Um, but we have probably another year with Title 42. Okay. Well, Felicia, I don't quite understand you're saying if Title 42 had been lifted, you would have left right away. Don't, no, not right away. But don't but we these people still need the exemptions, right? Because as you said, most of them will not qualify officially for asylum. So Title 42 is supposed to let a person walk up to our port of entry and ask for asylum. And it's a, it's supposed to have gone back like before, the way it was before Trump, mm -hmm. before Trump came into office. So if you're able to do that, then you, you, you're not gonna be stuck in Reynosa for these long periods of time. If Title 42 had lifted, we probably would have finished the year out in Reynosa and slowly backed out. Like mine, we have a, a shelter there now, so we can never really leave Reynosa anymore because we have, we're, we fund the shelter and we built it. But if you're able to go to the port of entry, you're not stuck in Reynosa anymore. So we would have slowly left. So what but, I understand- But still, my question is, wouldn't most of them have been turned away because they didn't pass that credible fear interview? No, you're gonna be deported to your home country or expelled. You're not gonna be in Mexico. They're going to take you back to where Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala, Haiti, Haiti. Yeah. So just last week, our U.S. government has agreed to seven flights a day to Haiti alone. And what we heard in Tijuana that some of the Cameroons got flown back to Haiti because Haiti. Haiti. they yeah, were they black. black. Yeah. Everybody goes to Haiti. Oh <laughs> if you're black, God. you're going to Haiti. <laughs> The, but yeah, well, I'm we still were, not quite understanding, Felicia. Wouldn't these people still potentially 
be um, good folks to try to get the exemption and, and let them enter our country? As opposed so, to they seek asylum and they immediately are told no and they're expelled. So the exemption would go away. This exemption is only here because of Title 42. Okay. I see. Yeah. I see. Now, all that okay. stops. Yeah, this is Biden being nice right now. Oh, which is why I tell people don't knock him too much uh, because he's doing something very quiet right. that Trump never did. Okay, thank you. Yeah. And he's letting minorities cross. He's just not making it public, which is fine, which is unfortunate as well because more people should know. I mean, this is, he could do more, sure, but at least he's doing something and he's allowing a lot of people to cross every day under this very lax system. The system is very lax that we're doing. Oh, okay. Rox, what time for maybe one more question? Caroline's got her hand up. Yep. Yeah. Oh, okay. I um, just wondering what are the, uh, what qualifications are you asking for, for when you hire staff? What, what are you looking for in a staff person? Oh, our staff, they're mostly young women um, and they all come from the church. Uh, so they literally just do interviews all day and processing paperwork. That's it. Okay. Uh, after this ends, I don't even know if they would stay on. This is so the sidewalk school model had to change uh, because of the closure of the camp and because of this exemption process. Up to this point, all of our staff were asylum seekers who were with us for a year to six months. Um, and then also our Madam Moore staff was actually still with us. They just did it like through Zoom. They had, we, we held Zoom classes five days a week as well. Yeah. We like to keep our staff uh, so the kids don't see a lot of change. And a lot of our staff like to stay with us even after they cross. Mm -hmm. So we buy them laptops and we let them continue classes in Reynosa, even though they were sitting in Kentucky or Miami, they were still teaching the kids in Reynosa. Mm -hmm. so, so when you say church, what church? Uh, Mexico is a very religious place. Uh, we have partnered with a lot of churches there. Uh, this church in particular is Pastor Lily's church. Uh, Cindy DeVita is ran by Pastor Hector. Uh, Pastor Isaac runs another shelter. Okay. Pastor Magrante are nuns. So it's different churches. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So I have much. gotten in more trouble in a better way than anybody I've heard from in a long time. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Now, Felicia, <laughs> you will send um, to rocks and she'll get it to us. Um, like when you're gonna be in Tijuana and the yes. names of those people and- um, Yeah, the, the NGOs and also um, it would be great to have a list of these various pastors and churches that are, that are involved. <laughs> so, you know, as we continually build community on who's doing what, where, so it's, I think it's important that we all know each other. Um, yes, yes, yes. Please donate to our partners in Mexico. They do a fantastic job and, and obviously they live there. Yeah. And Felicia, you know, I know that sometimes it's hard money wise to get the money to the NGOs in Mexico, right? Yes. Yeah. So, yes. We take it to them. People have donated to okay. us in the comment right. section. If you write uh, like Cinda DeVita or Casa Grante, Reynosa. Yeah. Yeah. I got it. We give it to them. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Please support Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, others will see this, you know, our recording goes out to uh, other people who are either working full-time right now or just couldn't be on for whatever reasons. Um, oh, wonderful. So uh, the WeShare process is going on in Tijuana too. So I don't want anyone to worry. People are crossing there as well. It's just in a smaller number, but they're crossing. And, and let me, again, it's H-U-I-S-H-A? Yes. 
Okay. It's called Weisha Weisha. It's a legal case. You'll see it when you put in okay. the two words. Yeah. Okay, great. As we continue to educate ourselves, so we can continue to educate others. And another question would be, uh, would if you could say something about how um, how a person or a community, if they wanted to sponsor a family, who they contact and kind of what that process is, if you, you know. You know, we've been looking for sponsors forever. Yeah. Anyway, so give that some thought too. Oh, I will, because people actually need sponsors very badly. Uh, I just had someone living with me, a woman and her two children, and she did right. not have a sponsor at all. Right. So let me give it some thought and get back to you. Okay. Okay. That'd be good. Because Paulina just is not on. She's the director of Espacio Migrante in Tijuana. And she just sent a message. She couldn't be on this morning that they need a sponsor of course, for a Haitian woman and three kids. So yes. anyway. Yes. That's something that we need to explore. Yeah. Right. Uh, definitely, because there's some families that do need sponsors in, uh, in Reynosa. So yes, let me see the best way to gather. And none of us, a lot of us are close, although, you know, we have connections in El Paso and we have connections, at, you know, closer to the border, but none of us are close that are on this call. But anyway. Okay. Um, continue the conversation in your, you know, when you have spare time after you've worked for 10 or 12 hours, you can, <laughs> you can email me. Okay. And you. your, your uh, voicemail box is full, by the way. <laughs> yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe you should leave it that way. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah. Thanks. Uh, thank you, everybody. It was and nice I meeting know, everyone. And I know it's, it's, the work is so difficult and sharing it is so difficult. And thank you. Thank you. Okay. Bye everybody. Talk Bye. to you soon.